This thing's talking to me. All right. John chapter 13, verse 31. This is on the, the last night, the night of the Passover. And it says, when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. You know, the opening hymn we had today is definitely one of my favorites. I just love that hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Besides the fact that I just love the lyrics in that hymn, the tune. I mean, the tune is one of the best known tunes in all creation. Uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the fourth movement, Ode to Joy. Uh, just fabulous, fabulous piece of music. It was really, uh, that's his triumph, as it were, of his opus. Um, I mean, there really wasn't anything he wrote that was any better than that. And the interesting thing about it is, when he wrote it, he was completely deaf. He never heard a word, or never heard a note of that symphony. And just to think that he was able to do that is truly phenomenal. But it also kind of brings to the question, why would God give such an incredible talent to somebody and not let them relish the final product? What kind of God is that? Another composer that is one of my favorites, he's a modern composer, actually. <laughs> I have to laugh, he's out on tour right now at the age of 70, uh, and that's Pete Townsend of The Who. Um, I guess he'll never die. I mean, he's just, <laughs> <laughs> he just keeps on going. But, uh, but Pete Townsend is truly, he is an incredibly talented composer. But when he was growing up, as a young man, as a young boy, and into his teens, his uncle sexually abused him for years and years and years. But from that experience of sexual abuse, he ended up being able to write two rock operas that basically proclaim what happened and the ability to overcome. Tommy and Quadrophenia. Those two rock operas, not only were they fabulous um, rock albums, but they were also made into full length movies. Yeah, there was a lot that came out of that. And you may say, well, both Beethoven and Pete Townsend, neither one of them are practicing Christians. So, you know, maybe if they were, wait a minute. You all know um, the poet laureate of contemporary Christian music, as somebody described him, Michael Card. Michael Card had a very troubling youth. During his teens, he com uh, considered committing suicide many times during that time. He ended up writing about it in a song called The Edge. It appears on the uh, album Poema. And in the edge, he says, I promise that I will always leave the darkness for the light. And it talks of his struggle with the idea of suicide. It's quite a testimony. Now, we've all been struggling one way or the other, whether we are Christians or not. We've all been struggling especially over these last couple of years. And many have asked, well, is this God's judgment? Is God mad at me? You know, I've heard, oh gosh, I've heard all of that. There was a very popular book in the 1980s that made the rounds of the evangelical circles, sadly, um, that tried to answer these questions. 
The book was entitled, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And it was written by Harold Kushner, who's a Jew, exactly. This is not a proclamation of the Christian gospel, even though it was making the rounds of the evangelical circles. It did not proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ in our lives. The basic theme of when bad things happen to good people was this. God does his best and is with his people in their suffering, but he is not fully able to prevent suffering. That's the theme of that book. That's not the gospel. <laughs> He tried real hard. Oh, yes. like you read that biblically, I think Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good, so those people who think they're good. <laughs> All right. But anyway, so what is the gospel? Well, in the gospel lesson that we heard today, in John chapter 13, Jesus says to Judas, what you are going to do, do quickly. He knows that Judas is going to betray him. He knows that that's what he is about that night. And so, as Father David pointed out a couple of weeks ago, Judas went out, quote, and it was night. Darkness had descended. It was, it was clear that the end was coming very quickly. And Jesus knows at that moment that his time is short. His time has come. But what does he say to his disciples? Oh, woe is me. No. What he says to his disciples is, now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. He knows that his passion is upon him. He's prophesied it three times to his disciples. He knows he's going to be beaten. He knows he's going to be crucified. He knows he is going to die in the flesh. But he is looking through that humiliation. He is looking through that pain. He is looking through the cross and his death to the resurrection and exaltation to God's right hand. He is looking to the resurrection. Without the crucifixion, there is no resurrection. You have to go through it. Without the suffering, there is no victory over death. In Romans chapter 8, Paul puts this for us in this way. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. It's not that God wants us to have this suffering. It's not that God is making this suffering for us, but he will go through it with us. He will sustain us through that, but he is calling us to keep our eyes firmly focused on him, for it is in him that we will find the victory over pain, suffering, death, and we will be in his resurrection. Think about it this way, of those examples I gave at the beginning of this sermon. If Beethoven had not become deaf, the power and the frustration that he was feeling in all of that would never have been made manifest in his music. When he started going deaf, one of the first things that he wrote was the Fifth Symphony. And you can hear the frustration in that. <laughs> you know, it, and as you listen to his early music, it sounds a lot like Mozart. The latter music doesn't sound at all like Mozart. There was a massive change in the way he went about writing his music. There were a lot of high notes, and suddenly there were a lot of low notes. There may be something to that. You know? yeah, what you hear. yeah, what you can hear. I mean, he wrote. Moonlight Sonata by laying his head on the piano. Incredible, just incredible. 
If Pete Townsend hadn't suffered child abuse, neither one of those two rock operas would have probably ever been written. He didn't have the material for it. If Michael Card hadn't struggled as a teen, he wouldn't have had the material for some of his greatest works. Awesome, just truly awesome. And as we see in the lesson from Acts today, if the disciples hadn't been persecuted, they would not have left town and continued to spread the gospel. All things, all things work together for good to those who love God, even the painful things and broken shoes. This is driving me nuts. <laughs> I'm going to fall over with my face. Here. I could take the shoes off. Jesus has been there, my friends. He knows what we are going through, and he will walk with us through all of the trials and tribulations in our life. Jesus willingly, lovingly suffered for our sake. Michael Card, again, had a wonderful word, uh, word for that in his song, Why. In the song, Why, he says, why did they nail his feet and hands? His love would have held him there. Jesus willingly suffered that we might have life and we might have the glory of God in our lives. Everyone struggles, Christians, non-Christians alike, but we have Jesus. Sean was pointing that out just a little bit ago. We have Jesus. We have him in our lives and we have his peace. And he has made the way. And when we stay in him, we will follow him through all of the trials and tribulations of our lives. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In Jesus we may have peace. In me you may have peace. In the world you will have tri tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, knowing all of this, what do we do? Let me give you two examples that came to me this week. One of them, I was reading a, a story about James Frazier of Bray. I know all of you know exactly who that is, right? It was somebody I'd never heard of, to be honest with you, but um, another priest told me about him. He was what was called a covenanter in Scotland. Uh, he was called a covenanter because what they were, they were the early Presbyterians, is basically what it was. They re rebelled against the Episcopal authority of the Church of England. And they wanted to have Presbyterian ordinations, ordination by pastors as opposed to by bishops. Okay. So anyway, James Fraser of Bray was imprisoned because he opposed the crown. Now, he had been married only a short time, and his wife was incapable of keeping the estate. He went bankrupt. His wife died. He was in prison. He had no idea when he would ever get out. But he spent every day writing in his diary about the experience that he was having with the Lord. And at one point, he says, now, what good does this bring me? The messenger is certainly harsh featured, but it too has a love token from the king. That's an awesome word. The messenger is certainly harsh featured, but it too has a love token from the king. He ultimately was released from prison. He married again. He had children. He grew to a nice old age. God spared him. The other example is much more contemporary. Miranda and I, as Miranda pointed out a minute ago, 
went to Metkin Abbey. And on the last day, as we were leaving the Eucharist, Father Jonas Gerard, one of the monks, came running up to us just as we were walking out the path. And he handed me a CD. And he said, this CD is a recording of my brother's music. And I want you to have it. So we gladly received it. I listened to it this week. <laughs> I wrote a thank you note to Brother Ger Jonas Gerard. That was the most haunting, spiritually uplifting CD I've heard in a very, very long time. But how it came about is what's interesting. It seems that Nonong, his brother, uh, Nonong was a great musician and a choir master nationally known in the Philippines. His uh, choirs had won many, many awards over the years, but he was diabetic. And in 2012, his diabetes flared and all of his organs began to shut down. And so Father Jonas Gerard was told by Father Stan, the, the abbot at Mepkin Abbey, to go home and take care of your brother. So he flew to the Philippines and he and his older sister began to take care of Nonon. But they also encouraged him to not give up on his music. And they encouraged him to go back into the studio and do some recording. Well, he couldn't lead choirs anymore. He didn't have the, uh, the uh, breath to be able to do that. He would cough, he would choke, he would do all, and he couldn't lead um, choir music. But what he did, it says uh, on the fly sheet inside the CD, it says he recorded each vocal part himself and mixed them together so that we have choir music of only his own voice. The wonder of technology. He labored through gasps and coughs and in between dialysis sessions to record these songs. All things work together for good. He would have never gone into the studio and made that album if it hadn't been for the circumstances of his life. All things work together for good for those who love God. Jesus is looking to the cross in today's gospel. He is not looking at the cross. He is looking through the cross to the resurrection and exaltation to the right hand of God. He says to his disciples, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. And then just a few chapters later in John 17, in the great high priestly prayer, he says this to the father. I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. He's looking through the cross. He's looking through the passion. He's looking through the pain. He is persevering forward, knowing that he will return to the Father's side and be seated at the right hand of God in glory. He has overcome the world and he came from the father and has returned to be seated at the right hand of God in glory. <coughs> we, you and I, we are the body of Christ. If God was glorified in Jesus' body on the cross and in the resurrection and in his ascension to glory, he will be glorified in Christ's body here and now. When those troubling times happen in our lives, keep the focus. It's so easy to look at the, at the troubles. It's so easy to get distracted and be concerned with worldly concerns. It is so easy to get caught up in the pain. But if we keep the focus on the Lord and look toward him, he will carry us through. Keep the focus. Look through the troubles, seek the Lord, and keep your eyes on the resurrected Christ. Now, now is the Son of Man glorified in us. It's a done deal. We celebrate his grace, his mercy, 
and he is with us now. And Jesus will carry us through every trial if we turn to him. Amen. 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 <clears throat>